Hey everybody, thank you for listening to Performance Anxiety. This episode welcomes Ken Stringfellow of the Posies to the show. We start with an in-depth chat about the history of the Posies. Then there's Ken's adoption, the unreleased movie Ken, his tour to support his solo album that was released on September 11th, 2001, and then there's new Posies music. There's so much in this show that I can't even touch on it all in this intro. Follow Ken and the Posies on social media, they're easy to find. Follow us at Performance ANX. Subscribe, rate, review, and share, and let's jump right into Ken Stringfellow. Hello, this is Ken Stringfellow from the Posies uh, and many other things. You're listening to the Performance Anxiety Podcast. We've got quite a few things to talk about here uh, on the eve of, uh, for example, my solo tour, which will bring me to the Bright Fox Theater in Winchester, for example, on March 7th, as well as many other places. Uh, and so we're going to be delving into, uh, gosh, a little bit of everything from the beginning of my career up until its future. Did you come from France to start doing these tours, or uh, have you been on the West Coast for a little while now? Uh, I, we got in yesterday. Um, oh, wow. I'm here. I'm actually going. It's a little complicated, my life and lifestyle, but I'm here with my daughter uh, this week. Um, you know, she's visiting her boyfriend who lives out here in the desert. I'm just, today, I spent we spent time with my biological father who lives out here in the desert. And then during the week, uh, we're going to be working on the Posies album because our drummer lives here in L.A. So, oh, well, OK. So it's that. And then I go back, drop my daughter off, and then I come back again to start the tour. Oh, wow. Man, yeah. you're not kidding. That is complicated. All <laughs> a day's work. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much for joining me and, uh, and spending a little time with me and talk a little bit about your career. I, I really, really do appreciate it. Yeah, sure. My pleasure. You're about to start, uh, I guess it's a solo tour, right? It's just, it's just, it's just you or is there going to be a band backing you up on this? No, it's solo. And I've been basically doing this tour or, you know, doing this particular show for a few months now. So basically, um, I'm touring, playing, uh, this album of mine called touched, which came out in 2001. Right. Uh, not only did it come out in 2001, it came out on September 11th, 2001, and therefore has a very particular history with that historical moment right. uh, of what people were going through. And uh, the album, you know, um, kind of has, I don't know, it kind of was the right medicine for that time. It's its one of those things that we can say there are no coincidences, and the album seemed to fit with people's mood. It's It, it has its requisite share of kind of grief and loss and that kind of thing kind of interwoven into it. But it also comes out of there. It's, you know, it goes into those depths and then comes out in a more, with a more positive uh, resolution. And for that reason, I think it was very uh, comforting for people in those times that were full of anxiety and, and emotions that we didn't know what to do with. Um, and when I when I released that album, I uh, and, you know, of course, the, the day of the release, it was 9-11. And, yeah. I, you know, I decided in the following days that I would try and do as much of the tour as possible. Um, so uh, there's a couple shows during that week that didn't happen for obvious reasons, right. but by actually by the Friday after September 11, which was a Tuesday, um, I got on a plane and, uh, flew out to the East coast and, and started the tour basically where I could. Um, so by virtue of that, I played in New York city on September 20th and it was a very intense show, very memorable. And so why this is all happening this year or starting last year is the venue I played on that tour, the Mercury Lounge, um, was having their 25th anniversary last year. And okay. they were doing like a, like a best of like their, their favorite shows of the last 25 years. And they really wanted me to come back and revisit 
wow. touched a la that show that I did there in 2001. Oh, wow. So uh, I, I did. So that was the, the, the anchor date, as we say. Um, and once I announced that show, uh, there's a lot of people interested in seeing that album performed and just people, you know, have a real special. It's, it's the album that people ask me about the most of my solo work. For oh, sure. I can imagine. Um, yeah. And I think it's not all, I think it's, you know, it's a good album and I think it's got certain qualities that, that, that are kind of unique, which we can talk about later. But right. of course, because it was the album that came out around that time and it was such an emotional time for people, it's kind of been, they kind of bonded with it in a, in a very special way. Um, and that's why people keep coming back to that album, I think in a lot of ways. So I played the, you know, so once I had the New York show, other people wanted to see the show. So then that, it just kept expanding. And now, um, you know, here I am coming back for another round in the U S. Um, and I've, you know, I've recently done, I was in Spain, I was in the UK, Ireland, Belgium, um, doing the show. And I think it'll keep going. Um, I, I think that I'll be doing a few more of these touch shows in Europe, Okay. Uh, and, and blah, 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 but <laughs> certainly like, um, this round of us touring that'll, that's coming up, uh, I would imagine will, will be, you know, I've kind of gone everywhere you can go in the U S on this <laughs> tour. One of the things that I, I thought was amazing going back to the release date was that you took the album on tour when a lot of people were canceling their tours. Mm -hmm. just because of the uncertainty of the times. And I think that might be another reason why it, it's connected with so many people is, you know, you were willing to go out and say, no, I'm going to uh, people, you guys, everybody needs this. I mean, they were canceling yeah, baseball kind of games thought. and, and yeah, yeah, all the sports were canceled. TV was all news all the time. And, you know, it, it was a good uh, distraction and a good catharsis for people at the same time. I think personally that, that for me, you know, music has been there for me. Um, the music that I love listening to has been there for me at the worst times in my life. Yep. Uh, and it is, you know, kind of, um, companion in a sense, an invisible companion, uh, an imaginary friend. No, it's real, <laughs> but it's just, it's invisible, but right. it sounds, it sounds like music. Um, and so, you know, I can understand why people cancel their tours, um, especially in more complicated tours that involve lots of yeah. travel and logistics that, that, you know, were being disrupted at that time. But there's also probably some feeling maybe amongst some people that they didn't want to be seen as, uh, doing something, I don't know, self-serving or, uh, frivolous or, mm -hmm. um, or un, uh, that didn't acknowledge that, the, you know, it was like a matter of respect, I suppose, for some people that they thought, well, OK, this is like a kind of funeral moment. I'm not going to be uh, doing my celebratory kind of thing, you know, and, and I felt like this music is not inappropriate. I felt like, you know, we're, I'm not I'm not uh, ignoring people's grief um, and I'm not trying to profiteer off their grief. Okay. Uh, yeah. I just I'm coming here to show up because I said I would. And because I believe that music has a role in, in these kind of moments. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, maybe not every music, but, uh, you know, it, but, but some, but there's a lot of different kinds of music, just like there's a lot of different kinds of ways of human behavior, not there. Right. Emotions. There certain things work at certain times. And yeah. I felt like this was okay. Um, and I wasn't afraid. And I also didn't have like a crew or a band that I was dragging with me and making them go through the bumpy ride of, of travel, which really wasn't that bumpy. I mean, actually once, once flights resumed on Friday, you know, life was starting already to head back a little bit to normal. And I, right. I think for the New Yorkers who came out to that show on the 20th of September, 2001, um, I think for them, it was a big deal that life was starting to have some things get back to normal. Of course, New York was still disrupted. And, the, and I'll, I'll tell you that when I landed on Friday at, at uh, Newark airport, that the site was still smoldering. You could wow. see this column of smoke coming up from where the twin towers had been. I mean, it was still a very fresh wound yeah. uh, psychologically and physically on the city. Uh, but, you know, damn it, you know, we're going to try and just, 
not be completely cowed by this, you know? Yes. Um, and, and I felt like also like having my world and my, and music and all those things that I love, I, I felt like that's a victory. I'm not going to hand to those people who, who did those terrible acts. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to let them destroy everything that I love. Um, and I'm, you know, going to stand up to that kind of, you know, it's called terrorism for a reason because aside from the immediate effects of, of people being killed, which is bad enough, it, it sends this message and it puts out this wave of fear um, that, that prevents people from living their normal lives, even after the, the actual effects of the, the immediate effects of the attacks. And you don't want to subscribe to that. So going back a little further, let, let's, let's go back to early on. When did you start playing music and, and did you start on, I think I read you started on piano. Was that mm -hmm. right? How old yeah. were you when you started? Uh, I'm eight or nine. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I had this real fascination with music and my parents' record collection. And that just kind of obsessed me. I mean, I was completely, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I have some kind of borderline Asperger kind of things. And so when I get into something, I really get into it. Um, Another feeling. <laughs> and so I was completely obsessed with my parents' record collection and had kind of memorized it. Um, then I could blind test like almost any record that they had and, and could, you know, tell you which composer, which blah, blah, blah. Cause they had a lot of classical music. Okay. Um, but of course they had other things too. Um, but anyway, so they saw that I had a keen interest in music and, uh, they knew, uh, also they, we, you know, I'm adopted and I'd been, we've been given just enough information not quite correctly, but, but close enough that there was music in my, in my parents' background. Okay. And in, in your, uh, your biological parents' background. Right. Okay. So they, they, they knew that there was something there. And then, then when they saw I had such keen interest in music, they felt they should probably encourage that. And, um, Wonderful. that there was, you know, reason that that was happening. And so they got a, a piano and I got piano lessons. Um, but that wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, it's quite funny because I mean, I was glad to have a piano, very glad. Um, but classical music, piano lessons, you know, which is a good first guess for my parents. It's a good fundamental way to approach music. Oh, yeah. Um, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. You know, I would, I would sort of shirk off the, the homework as it were, yeah. um, to, to just play you know, and improvise. Um, but I did get oh, yeah. some feel for the piano, uh, at, from these lessons, you know, I'm not like an incredible piano player, but, um, you know, I got a fairly natural familiarity with the instrument okay. that gives me some fluidity, you know, when, when needed. Well, I mean, that makes sense. Cause uh, I don't know any, I don't know too many eight year olds that are into playing classical music. Right. I mean, I like listening to it. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, you know, I mean, I, I loved the, uh, you know, Holst's planets and all these kind of things, you know, that are so great um, as a kid. Um, but, I, but, but, the, but you don't play that when yeah. you're a beginning piano student. The right. stuff is really rudimentary and not very, uh, not very enticing, shall we say. So when did you switch to guitar? Uh, well, uh, so you know, when, when I started piano, we were living in suburban Chicago, uh, and, and my mom and dad, that is to say, well, you know, mom and dad, right? Yeah. We, the adoptive, the, the biological parents will put them aside because I don't encounter them till later. Okay. Uh, but, um, mom and dad, uh, split up in 1978 and my mom and I moved to Bellingham, Washington. And, um, we, my mom and I moved to Bellingham. She remarried, uh, and my stepdad, um, he came with a, a house uh, and that was out of town a little bit. Um, and it was, we used it as a summer place. And then, you know, he basically moved in with us for, okay. you know, basically, but we still had his house, which is out in the sticks a little bit and out in this house where we'd we'll go out and enjoy the lake during the summer. Uh, there was a guitar. Um, he had, um, 
after his first marriage and before his marriage to my mom, he had a girlfriend for a while and that girlfriend's son played guitar and had left this guitar behind. Oh, like okay. evidently he wasn't really into it, but uh, this guitar yeah. was there and it was forgotten oh, wow. essentially. And, um, I thought that that, you know, that was great. So I, I learned to, to play it basically. And it was in, you know, a 1960s acoustic guitar, like really, really difficult to play, um, oh, yeah. which was excellent um, because it, it forced me to try really hard. You know, it was really high action and really big strings. And yep. uh, it was like an archtop acoustic um, Orpheus brand, wow. something like a Harmony, basically, Okay, something, if you're familiar with that, like really yeah. similar. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I struggled on this guitar and that got me, you know, some serious strength yeah um in, in, a, in a couple of years and then so you know that's probably like sixth grade um and in seventh grade um i uh, there's a, a a teacher at our middle school who after school also he basically had like an extracurricular guitar class and he taught lessons i didn't learn from him but at one point he had mentioned he was selling an electric guitar and an amp. Um, and so I bought that, uh, oh. from him, like, um, like, um, the guitar is a, is an Italian Vox from, from the early seventies basically. Okay. Um, so, uh, it's called a super meteor. It's a one pickup, vaguely Stratocaster shaped <laughs> vaguely. Uh, guitar. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not quite as thin as a Stratocaster and the, and the, the horns are a little sharper and, blah, blah, blah. But it's not so it's it, the closest equivalent in, in more common guitars is a Strat. Okay. And then that amp was a little PV, uh, backstage 30 amp. So that was my first electric thing. And of course, by that point, after, you know, I've been playing for a year or two on an acoustic guitar that was quite difficult playing electric was, you know, like, a, like a breeze. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so when did you start playing with other people? Well, at the same time. Oh, really? So, okay. uh, yeah. So when I was in sixth grade, um, a class, I had a classmate and we became friends and he was a, already a pretty good guitar player. Oh, wow. Um, and so he and I hit it off and we both liked the same stuff, you know? And, uh, so we, we started, we actually put a band together Oh, cool! and, and played all through middle school. First I was playing keyboards. Um, and we, and the school had like this, um, like a kind of transistor, uh, organ, um, how would I describe it? Um, it wasn't like a Farfisa or a Continental or something like that. It was like an, like an iteration from there, like with different yeah. presets, but it was basically a transistor based simple, um, I mean, like you can imagine like a slight update from a Farfisa with some of those same sounds, but a few different uh, you know, like a, like a reed or trumpet or oh, whatever, okay. or, you know, but, it, yeah, but yeah. it wasn't digital, you know, it was, it was from the seventies. Right. Yeah. So we had that and you could do a pretty fairly, um, respectable, um, uh, Lucy in the sky with diamonds, for example, oh, wow. dun, 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 dun. you could do that sound and you could do other stuff. But then I moved to guitar. Um, we all decided it was more rock and roll and it was more portable because the keyboard wasn't ours, but we could, right. with the guitar, we could do whatever. Um, and so, you know, we had like a two, two guitars, bass and drums band oh, with wow. kids from middle school. And we played school events, basically, you know, I don't think we ever played off campus, but we played right. some stuff at the school. <laughs> okay. When did you, uh, end up meeting up with John Hour? Shortly thereafter. So, uh, after three, after the middle school was done three years of middle school, uh, we moved on to high school and I was still buddies with Chip who I'd formed this first band with Chip Westerfield. Okay. Um, and we still, you know, basically had this band going. We, you know, we high school obviously is a little busier in terms of academics and whatnot. You know, we ostensibly would still get together and play at the drummer's garage. Um, and so that year, my freshman year, um, is when John moved to Bellingham. He had lived there before, 
Um, but he moved away for a while um, and he moved back. And so he's a year younger than I am. So I was okay. 14 at this time and he was 13. Um, so, and he, you know, had earned a very quickly a reputation as a kind of guitar prodigy. Oh, okay. Wow. Who could, who could play, you know, any solo by Van Halen or Whoa. anything like that. Yeah. I mean, he was like, had just insane chops. Wow. Um, and so we, uh, we, we had heard about him and then one day we heard somebody playing at the music store downtown well, you know, which was one of the places we would hang out in after school. And it had, we're like, it has to be that kid that we've been hearing about. So <laughs> we went and approached him and, you know, my friend Chip was really the leader of the band. So he, he went and talked to him and I was, you know, moved over to just singing and John became our new guitar player. We still didn't play any gigs. We, we just basically jammed in the garage of, uh, of our drummer, but at least that got John and I connected and then the next year, when I was a sophomore, he was a freshman and he came to our school. Right. Uh, and then we could really start hanging out. And, you know, there was always a band around that had us in it. Um, right. Also with our friend Chip uh, at times. And then I had other bands and sometimes John would guess with that. And, you know, that, that kind of thing. So we're, you know, just got really involved. And, and John around this time had made a studio in his house with his dad. Oh, wow. His dad was a college professor, so his dad had a good gig. Yeah. Uh, and thus had some extra money, and uh, but was a very dedicated amateur musician and, you know, really good guitar player and, and et cetera, great folk musician. And so as a project, um, they piece by piece put together a little analog recording studio in their basement. Oh, wow. And so this was John and my playground. Basically, every day after school, we would go and futz around in the studio. That's amazing. So, the, the Posey started off as just the two of you, right? Yeah. Well, even this is still, we were in high school, so this is way, the Posey's are like three years away. Okay. Yeah. We just did other other things. Sometimes, uh, well, there's any number of things you can do, like um, school projects that you can make an audio you know, presentation for, or, you know, ex musical experiments of any kind, so you guys were just, um, et cetera. You guys were down in the basement, just basically exploring audio and experimenting then. Yeah. With whatever you could do. And, and sure. Stretch. And, and, and you know, boundaries. different. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, John was at that time, um, a really good, uh, drum programmer. Oh, really? Um, wow. yeah. And so, he, you know, uh, he just had learned, um, this Yamaha RX 11 drum machine, like really inside and out and, and could do some really great stuff with it. And, you know, we, we kind of, we did some stuff with, that was like totally like synth based. Um, we, we did a little bit of everything. This really, some really unusual music, actually pretty cool. Oh man. Um, and I was also recording at home, uh, you know, bouncing stuff between two cassette players, this kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, um, man, yeah. Which is really cool and doing stuff like that. And I had a whole band that John wasn't really involved in, um, that, that did that kind of music. Like we did really unusual experimental kind of sounding things all improvised. Oh, wow. Um, then that we would bounce over, um, to, you know, a couple generations to do some different layers. That man, you know, that's a whole art form that nobody knows about, you know, after a certain age, kids don't know about that today. It's amazing. Right. Yeah. It has a certain flavor. That's for sure. Yeah, it does. And, um, that, that would be hard to recreate nowadays. Yeah. yeah Cause I mean, you can, you can down, you know, you do what, what I, I end up doing half the time on the podcast. You just download some software and you can just plug into it. And it's just, it's so much easier. It, it, I think it takes some of the, the charm out, out of a home recording at this point because you're not doing the, the, the editing work that, that, you know, it's not as physical or as, as manually intent, manual labor intensive as bouncing things off and lining them up, you know, on the cassettes. And, and it's, it's right. There's risks art. involved in the analog world because you can't undo it. Exactly. And every time you make a copy, it degenerates by a generation. 
Right. And that gives it a certain flavor. Yeah. Yeah. Which you don't get in, in, in the digital mm. world. So I always love going back and listening to the older old demos and things like that. Do you still have any of those demos or are they floating? Yeah, around? sure. Yeah, yeah, wow. sure. I mean, certainly a lot of the stuff that I did with my band, uh, the, 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 the non John band, right. um, the g- genetic defects, um, I have those tapes <laughs> and a stuff that John and I did. We have, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that survived. Yeah. That's amazing. So when did you guys decide to start the posies? And, and, and I guess before you get into that, or maybe while you get into that, how did you decide on the name, the posies? Uh, okay. So th- that's further down the line. So basically uh, I graduated high school in 1986 and I then moved on to attend the University of Washington in Seattle, okay. which is an hour and a half from Bellingham, where okay. we come from. And so, yeah, getting to university, John and I didn't really, you know, he was still in high school. You know, he's <laughs> one year one year behind me. So, uh, you know, we didn't really check in for, the, you know, I was just getting used to college life and a whole new deal, you know. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in... In when after the new year, basically, um, so we're talking the beginning of 1987. I checked in. We checked in with each other, and uh, found out that you know I'd been demoing a few songs. I'd had somebody uh, in the dorms who had a four track, so I could borrow the four track and and demo stuff. And there's a drum machine and all this stuff, and I could kind of um, make some. You know, I had some ideas for tunes, and I could kind of get them on tape and right. and. Basically, John and I compared notes and, and sort of, I don't know, we'd kind of gone somewhere else songwriting wise than we had been before. It had a, it had a particular flavor and it seemed just a little more organic, especially after coming through like synths and stuff like that, that we'd been, you know, doing stuff like that with drum machines and whatnot. Right. We kind of hit upon something a little more, I don't know, a little more timeless, I suppose. Um, okay. Still kind of quirky. I mean, if you listen to our first record, it's there's some it's not all strummy stuff it's kind of strange in a way <laughs> i mean there's some very 60s stuff yeah on that first record that. but there's also i mean like the song like blind eyes open It's kind of, I don't even know, it's kind of like hyper, it's a little bit like XTC, I guess, in that sense, and that they have this great pop sensibility, but they would also do stuff that's maybe more rhythmic and kind of hyperactive. It's yeah. Hyperactive sure. is a word that comes to mind with XTC's music, especially their early music, and we were big fans, so it's not a, it's not a surprise that there's a lot of XTC in that first record. Um, but yeah, so we, we when we had this first batch of tunes... Uh, we kind of realized we were onto something and really on a similar wavelength. And uh, we decided we'd do a band, um, but with who it was hard to say. Um, okay. So at some point, we made some acoustic demos at John's studio of a couple tunes and started to circulate those around. And I recently, I'd kind of forgotten all about this actually. Um, but I was on the tour, the solo tour last year and I was playing in Kentucky and the guy who was one of the writers for the Seattle music paper, the the free music paper that came out every month called the rocket. Um, his wife is from Kentucky and they moved to this little town and he opened a bookstore, blah, blah, blah. Oh my gosh. Um, so he came to the gig and he said, Hey, I've got something for you that I think you'll find this amusing. And he gave me a copy of our very first demo. Wow. Had the name, the poppies. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh my gosh. And I, you know, I, I just, I think, you know, for various reasons that sounded good to us at that time. Uh, and then we discovered there was a band already called that. And I think it was pretty close to when we were really starting to decide what to do, like how to make a record stuff like that. And, okay. Um, so we, we went for the posies, which is kind of like the next thing over. I mean, 
our heads were really in the sixties in many ways. Okay. Um, and that name makes sense in that sense, in that context. Okay. So like the um, whole flower power. Yeah. Something okay. like this, okay. you know, um, I think we wanted something that stood out from also like the prevailing winds of like, um, you know, like punk and, and uh, which, you know, we were listened to punk rock and we were fans of the bands, but you know, it had a certain, I don't know, aggression to it. And we were kind of against that in right. a sense, like, I mean, for us, I mean, you know, uh, we were, yeah. we didn't, that wasn't where our heads were at. We, we were, really kind of, you know, Pacific people. Um, and that's just kind of where we were at. Um, it's funny because as our live show changed over the years, we became like a really aggressive band, but yeah. we, we come from this place of a really, of a real gentle start. I mean, like it, like the, the, there's nothing threatening about the Posies first album right <laughs> well, and, 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 and i think that had a real interesting effect actually um in that you know i mean i've been to lots of punk shows and and you know it's like it's like a dude thing at a certain oh, yeah. point you know because of the slam dancing and stuff i yeah. mean women could get involved but it's you know like it just, it, that's not how it worked out. It was shirtless dudes like yeah. beating on each other, basically. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really fun. Yeah. But in that sense, if you're like, you know, an alternative listening woman and you don't want to be around that energy, like you didn't have a lot of options at that time, you know, because all ages shows, the most common ones at that time were generally punk rock shows and they were kind of violent. Yes. And that's just the way it is. And so along comes this band um, whose main advertisement, you know, our name is basically saying we are not that, you know, we are yeah. like a safe space. So we absorbed in the early first couple of years of the posies, like basically all the people who didn't want to be at those shows, you know, they were looking for an alternative to the aggression of those shows. That's basically. really great thinking. Actually, that that's a really different mindset at the time. Well, we didn't conceive of that. It's just what happened. <laughs> wow. It wasn't like we were saying, Oh, this is going to work because right, no, it's right. just that we were that way. And, and suddenly we attracted a really big audience because people wanted something not aggressive, not, yeah, yeah. I think. And, and it's basically like a safe space, Okay, you know? So, um, you know, people who, uh, you know, to every stripe of person who might not feel comfortable uh, in a hyper masculine, somewhat violent environment came t to us because they had nowhere else to go. But they also, you know, and we, they, you know, we were likable too. So people, um, you know, really bonded with us. Well, and the songs are good. So that helps. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so the, f the first album was, uh, based off the demos that you'd sent. Uh, and then you, you had to actually go on tour and you had to put together a touring band. Now the first album, when you were recording it, mm -hmm. how you, you put together a band after the album came out, right? Is that, am I that right? Me? So basically our quest for finding people to play with us was unsuccessful. <laughs> um, nobody could quite get their heads around what we're trying to do because it was different, you know, if we'd said, you know, oh, we want to do like a goth thing or we want to do a punk thing or whatever, I, you know, pe people would have gotten into it. I mean, the, the, the prevailing winds of music at that time would be something along the lines of like Big Black or something like that. Something that was really heavy and, and aggressive and, and kind of like, you know, angry in a sense. Yeah. And that made sense to people. But what we were doing did not, you know, like there just was no, I mean, maybe like a band, like I think we were, we were, what we were doing had more in common with like the Smiths or something like that. Okay. Um, but as, and the Smiths are one of my favorite bands, but even what they do had a specific flavor that's kind of related to, because it's maudlin and melancholy, 
it's kind of fit in with like a little bit of the goth mentality of okay. like, you know, it's, it's like illegal to be happy kind right. of thing. Yeah. Um, and that's not where we were at either. So we were really like very much alone in our thing. Um, so it, for other musicians, they were like, they didn't see it. They didn't share our vision. So they weren't interested. Um, wow. It, okay. it didn't. Yeah. That's really odd. I mean, considering also like just clearly how good a musician John is, I would have thought that that would have attracted people, but did this, yeah, just, we didn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. You were um, which is, which is a, which is a good sign when you think about it now. Right. Um, it's, it's a good sign to be so different that, that you're, that you're out of step, you know, with everything going on around you that, 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 that's, that could work in your favor, um, for, for, in terms of, you know, making your own mark. But at yeah. the time we were just kind of like puzzled that nobody wanted to do anything with us. Yeah. I was gonna say it could make it, I imagine it would make it difficult at the time for you guys to, to figure out what, why, why can't we play with anybody? Why, why are we having this trouble? Right. So what we decided to do was record all the songs we have. So, so that everybody could hear each song complete and okay. that this would be like a demo to get other musicians. And then we go do things. Okay. This is how we viewed it. Okay. Um, so we, and we had the studio, so no problem, you know? So, right. um, over basically we did a little bit in the summer of 1987, basically did one song and then kind of demoed some others acoustically. Okay. And without all of that feeling good, we came back over the Christmas break, 87 to 88. Um, and now we're talking about my second year of co at the university of Washington. Right. And now John is attending, uh, Western Washington university in Bellingham. Okay. Um, the same school where his dad was a professor. Uh, and so, you know, I would just commute up to Bellingham and we'd work in the studio and, and we, we made, uh, 12 songs and, uh, by, so it was like around, uh, by the, you know, we had the Christmas break to do a lot of work. And then in January and February, as you know, there's a lot of holidays, you know, yeah, yeah. MLK president's day, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So I had some three day weekends to come up and, 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 you know, take the Greyhound up to Bellingham and we'd work in John's studio. Um, and then, and you know, mixing, John did the mixing in one night because so we had an, we had eight tracks. So we, what we'd worked on was eight tracks of instruments and then we bounced that down to two uh, on a, on a DBX encoded cassette. Okay. okay. Um, and then bounced that back onto eight tracks, you know, a stereo instrumental thing. And we did six tracks of vocals and maybe a little percussion wow. on, on the tape. So the mixing was just mixing the vocals to the already mixed track. Okay. Essentially. Um, so that was something John could do in an evening. Um, and so that was in March uh, and then it gets really interesting. So basically, you know, John did the mixing thing and he played it for, uh, some friends of his in Bellingham, uh, and who, you know, everybody in the room was like, Hey, uh, this is kind of a little bit better than a demo. I think it, you know, it's 12 songs. I mean, sounds like a record to us. Yeah. yeah exactly. And he's like, Oh, maybe. Yeah. And yeah, sure. So he consulted me about that and we thought, well, why don't we just release it and see what happens? And, why not? um, at this time, you know, we didn't have the money or really the, even the knowledge as to how to do an LP and, and CDs were not really very common. Right, right. So, um, we decided to make a cassette that was easy. Yeah. Um, so that we could basically do ourselves. I, we, I, um, in fact, we did make them ourselves. Ba our mix, our mix down was to a cassette. Okay. Um, because John's quarter inch machine had broken. Oh, so no. never, never to return. So oh, we no. mixed, so we, we, we had an eight inch, uh, excuse me, a uh, eight track, half inch multi-track and the mixing was done to uh, the same dbx encoded cassette player very high quality cassette player yeah yeah but the, the master is a cassette wow um and in fact there was no mastering in fact we just basically <laughs> started dubbing this cassette to oh other my. cassettes wow um and that was the thing so we we bought a box of of 
uh, generic blank um, blank cassettes. Mm-hmm. There's a record store that sold you know bulk blank cassettes in a, in a clear plastic shell. Right. right. Um, so we we dubbed those. Uh, you know, we had uh, John had another um, cassette deck, a double cassette deck, so we could make two at once. Oh, wow. Uh, so on and so forth. So we made 50 of these, um, and we printed, uh, a, a friend of John's printed the covers, which, and the stickers, we got the templates and the whatever we made the stuff and we made the art or whatever. And, and you know, it's only a one color print job. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's just blue, blue type, blue borders, blue halftone photo. Yep. Um, and so that was really easy. We did that at the university print shop for nothing. And we had to wow. hit, cut the cassette covers ourselves. They were like printed at two to a sheet. Oh, wow. And then we had, you know, you buy the, the, the stickers that go on the cassette, you buy those on a thing. We could, okay. there's like 10 on a sheet or whatever. We printed those. We printed a whole bunch so we had a reserve of those, but we did a run of 50 cassettes. Wow. Um, and we gave those, we, we consigned them to a record store where he, where John already was working at a record store in, in Bellingham, consigned them to a record store in Seattle, um, where Scott McCoy, uh, musician in Seattle from the band, the young fresh fellows, blah, right. blah, blah, who we really, who we really idolized worked. And we gave one to Scott um, for a number of reasons, because we wanted to be on the label that released uh, the Young Fish Fellows, Pop Lemon Records. Right, right, yeah. And we also knew that Scott was a journalist uh, for the aforementioned free music monthly, The, the Rocket. Yeah. And Scott was just kind of a hero of ours, you know. He's right, a yeah. great musician, and, and we loved his band and blah, blah, blah. So we gave him a copy. And we dropped a copy off. We actually, we made, this is even crazier. We made a reel, uh, a quarter inch reel to reel somehow. I, I, um, <laughs> because we, uh, we, we didn't do it at our place. I don't know. John went somewhere and made this, but we made a quarter inch demo, uh, reel to reel. And we dropped that off at a commercial radio station in Seattle. Uh, you know, as we just did and we all we gave a copy to the college station in seattle as well oh my gosh so that was that out of those 50 and thinking we're talking now we're talking april like around the beginning of april okay of 1988 and several things happened that month Or, or end of march yeah end of march we're talking okay so april comes around the rocket comes out and scott has reviewed our cassette with a very glowing review. Uh, so there's that. Right. And then, and we're like, whoa. And then this, you know, like anybody who drops off something at a radio station, unsolicited, no track, you know, we had, we'd never played, a, we played like one acoustic, two acoustic gigs in Bellingham. Like we're nobodies. Right, right. It's pretty much guaranteed that that cassette is going in the bin. Right, and it's yeah. it's never going to be heard of again. Um, well, it didn't work out that way for us. Um, one day I was getting ready for school. Um, by now I was living in an apartment um, near the university. I'd moved out of the dorms. And I turned on the radio to the station that I listened to every morning, this commercial alternative station. And lo and behold, right as I turned on the radio, within five minutes, our song is playing. Oh, wow. And I was like, whoa, that's crazy. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it's, we're talking like... 9 a.m. on a weekday, like prime radio time. Yeah, yeah, people, drive people time. People pay for this stuff, Absolutely. you know? Um, and so I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. So uh, then I came back, you know, midday or whatever, turning on the radio, and there was the fucking song again. Like, it wow. basically went straight into their top rotation. Oh, um, my gosh. And that was really weird. And then they put another song into their top rotation. So two songs on a commercial radio station, you know, that will change your life yeah. for sure. So things started moving very fast. And then, and, and Scott McCoy, uh, basically the next time I went into the, to the record store and the cassettes just started disappearing immediately. <laughs> so we, you know, we had to make them and, you know, we had several cassette decks going now to make oh my these gosh. things. And John was taking promo cassettes from, uh, work and we were dubbing over them whether they were the right length or not. <laughs> um, this kind of thing. 
And then it started to snowball. So I, next time I saw Scott, he said, hey, do you guys, you know, things are going really well. You guys want to play a show? And uh, my wife's band is playing uh, a gig. And uh, do you guys want to play last? And we we're like, yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now I'm like, shit, now we need a band. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I've taken this gig. And <laughs> no, so I have to find people. And this is so I had been talking to a guy in one of my classes at the UW. And I... Uh, he'd mentioned that he had a roommate that was a drummer and he was a guitar player. And I said, look, buddy, uh, we got probably the best problem you could have. We've got gigs and all this stuff happening and we have no band. And I know you're a guitar player, but I don't think I could pull off playing bass and singing. Would you be willing to play with us for a little bit and move over to bass? And do you think your roommate would be interested in playing drums? And he was like, yeah, sure. It sounds cool. Let's check it out when we get together, you know, in a couple of days. Okay, cool. It turns out they live one block away from me. <laughs> uh, so, you know, went up to their house with John and the, you know, from note one, we, it just felt like a band. Oh, um, wow. and so there we, there we went. So luckily we, you know, we played the gig and then just stuff started happening. I mean, like we were playing to a thousand people in Seattle, like before the year was over Wow! Uh, at several times. Like we could do several shows like that a, a year. It was really bonkers That's um, because uh, of the things I was talking about. And um, because we were underage, we did a lot of un all ages things. Mm -hmm. um, and because also like we had this kind of like almost looking like the cure or something like that on, on, on in the first album. Okay. You know, we had like spray, big spray painted hair and stuff <laughs> like that. And even though our music was the polar opposite of goth music, um, because of the look, and I think because of some other, there is an underlying, I don't know, it's, it's not, the music is kind of cheerful in a sense, but there's like, the lyrics are a little bit down, a little bit like the Smith's formula. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, and we, a lot of goth kids came to our shows wow. and they loved it. I mean, for whatever reason, um, I think, you know, we, we were outcasts in a sense that made it. And I think that made us inspiring for other people who considered themselves outcasts. Okay. I, I, yeah, that makes sense. I get to see that. How did you, how did you get to the major labels at that point? You see so the first album ended up getting released on pop llama Right. And Later then that year. Yeah. And then you end up on Geffen. How did that happen? Well, I mean, imagine completely innocently. I mean, like, you know, we just, John and I are two people who ended up through the actions of various, you know, divorces of our parents living in Bellingham, Washington. Right. So it's not where either, it's not where any of our parents are from, but we ended up living there. And the nearest big city is Seattle. Mm -hmm. So, of course, when you want to leave Bellingham, you go to Seattle. It's rudimentary. It's right. just an hour and a half away. And I went to school there. And, of course, as soon as things started happening for us, uh, you know, we both dropped out of school. And John left Bellingham and came down to Seattle, blah, blah, blah. We didn't know that 1988 Seattle would become 1989 Seattle, which is basically the most the hottest music scene in the world right you know and that just continued to snowball so and we were already a proven success i mean just there's no other band that you can think of that was getting commercial radio airplay like that on a completely self-released album it, it is unheard of yeah um and so I have to say that it's a testimony. I mean, the songs are good, but I think that John's engineering um, is really, really good. So we, we had those things in our favor and that is like a no brainer for major labels. So every major label came calling. Okay. Pretty much immediately. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, we're playing to them. I record release show in Seattle. Like we could have sold out that venue three times over. We had like 900 kids. Wow. Like, I mean, there's just no way that it, like that's an A&R person's dream. Like they're doing all the work themselves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we, you know, um, and we went through several, uh, interviews and, um, luckily, and it's very interesting. Actually, Geffen came in towards the end of the whole process, which is a great move on Gary Gersh's part. Gary Gersh, of course, being really, a uh, 
kind of, a, you know, he's really one of the legendary A&Rs out there. Yeah. Um, and he, 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 he knew he, he was very, very savvy. <laughs> he let all the other bozos get it wrong, <laughs> yeah. you know, and play it, put all their cars in the table. And then he just came in like, you know, at the end basically and said, Hey, you guys want to be in a real label? Yeah. You know, basically. And of course, you know, like Geffen was the home of XTC, um, yeah. you know, our, like our favorite band basically. Um, and we we're like, yeah. And so he, you know, he said, I'm starting this boutique label within or an imprint within Geffen mm -hmm. and it's going to be you guys and Sonic Youth and John Doe. Does that sound good? And we're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that sounds really good. 